Welcome to Sakima's Ridge Homestead. I'm Brian, and today we're going to show you what we had to do to get this old space heater working. Come along. Hello, and welcome to our channel. And we're, we're glad, glad you're, you're here. here. Well, the first thing we'll do to make this easier to work on is take the top off. I've already taken the bolts out. They're kind of kind of tricky to get out. You need to, need to get new uh, clips for them because they're in pretty bad shape. But we'll take the top off. Set it over out of the way, and I'll bring you over here and show you what we got going on. Okay, we bought this heater used, and uh, the guy we bought it from, just a, just a young kid, said, yeah, it runs, but it shuts off. So I thought either the photo eye was bad, or it might have algae in the fuel and it was getting clogged up. So let's take a look and see what it does. And that's what it does. Absolutely nothing. The switch lights up, but nothing else happens. What it's supposed to do is you turn the switch on, this igniter here will heat up and glow for about five seconds. At that point, the motor kicks on, which starts the fan running, the air pump back here running, the air pump forces air through this tube in the back of the nozzle. This hose here draws fuel out of the tank through the nozzle and it ignites. And then the fan blows it and you have heat coming out the front. So let's uh, delve into this thing and see why it doesn't run at all. First thing we'll do is we'll take this side panel off because these little, uh, little buttons here, there's a control board on the other side of this panel attached to those buttons. So let's remove these four screws and uh, get inside this panel. To work on this, you just need a small hand full of tools. We've got uh, a couple nut drivers, I think a 5 16 and a quarter inch nut driver, a set of feeler gauges, a Phillips head wrench, and uh, what else did I oh, a little gauge and a multimeter. So now that we've got this off, there's our control board. First thing I would do is check for power. So we'll turn our multimeter on for AC voltage. Turn our switch back on. And I will back probe at the switch. And it's showing 119.2 volts. So we have power through the switch. If you take the wiring diagram, the black lead off the switch runs around to the other side of the heater. There's a thermostat over there. It's supposed to be turned up all the way, which it is. That thermostat then comes back on this black wire, which powers the board. So we've got our, our neutral here from the switch and our power from the uh, thermostat. So let's check it here and see if we have power at the board. And once again, we have 119 volts at the board. So we have power at our board, but we have nothing coming out. Let's check these two yellow wires, because that is the, uh, the igniter, which is what should be running right now. And we have nothing. So that would tell me the board is probably bad. show you one other thing on the board up close here. Another thing that tells me this board is probably bad, right here should be a resistor. Someone soldered a piece of wire in there. And right here should also be a resistor. And someone's soldered a bunch of wire in there. So we'll go ahead and change this board. To change the board, there's those five little clips. You just squeeze the tab in and pop the board off, so we'll do that and replace the board. I just use the end of the Test lead there to push those little tabs in. So we'll move that out of the way. 
power is off, so I'm not going to get shocked here. We'll remove all of our wires and grab the new board. Okay, there is there is the old card and there is the new card. As you can see, they're a little bit different. Most of the uh, components are on the back of the new card. I don't know if that's a uh, redesign and maybe get them a little farther away from the heat or, or what, but the new card has been redesigned. And also on the back of the old card, you can kind of see this is the solder repairs for those wires on the other side. It's kind of a kind of a cobbled together job. But let's get uh, this new card installed. Just snap it down on these plastic pins. If I wasn't upside down. Oh, look at that. It fits so much better when the holes are lined up. And we'll put our wires on. Uh, apparently someone's been in this before because they wrote the wire numbers or the wire colors over here on the side, but it's also listed on the board. The first one is one of the igniter wires. The second one is the red that goes to the motor. The third is the black coming from the thermostat. The fourth is your AC neutral. The fifth is the white wire coming back from the motor. The next one is your other yellow igniter wire. And the last two are the blue coming from the photo eye, which senses if there's a flame or not. So we'll go ahead and leave this off for the moment. Get you up closer here, and we will turn this on and see if indeed we have an igniter start to glow. sure you can see that igniter in there getting red hot. Now before we go further, let me tell you a little story about that igniter. If you're working on one of these heaters, these igniters are very delicate. This is the original igniter. Here's the other piece of it. This was like a little U-shaped wire that was on there. Uh, originally I started working on this in the garage and it got pretty chilly out so I ordered the new board the new board came and I told Paula, hey, I'm going to bring this in the house to do the video on it so it's a little bit warmer. And when I rolled this from the garage to the house, I had left this igniter out of the case. So it, uh, it bounced on the bottom of the heater and it broke. So because of my uh, lack of detail in putting this back into the case with the screw the way it should have been, it cost me $40 for a new igniter. So if you're working on one of these heaters, be very cautious of the igniter. They are very delicate. Okay, since I've admitted my mistake and told that story, let's go ahead and turn this back on again and see what happens. I think I mentioned before what's supposed to happen. You turn the switch on, the igniter glows for five seconds, and then the fan kicks on. And there we go, it did light. Time for a second story. <laughs> Yesterday, when I turned this on at this point, the fan, rather than kicking on like that and running, would jiggle like this, just a real fast jiggle. Sometimes it would jiggle and do nothing more than that. Sometimes it would jiggle and then start running in reverse. Sometimes it would jiggle and start running forward. If it would or I'd rather if when it would start to jiggle, if I would flick it with my finger, it would start to run and run fine. Uh, there was a capacitor on here. Um, I'll show a picture of it because it's already been changed. It was a plastic capacitor about the size of a roll of quarters. Um, I was pretty sure that was the problem, but what I did was take this motor off, took it to a local motor repair shop. If you're anywhere within driving distance of Salem, Ohio, I highly recommend Burger Electric. They're a motor shop just east of town, pardon me, just west of town. And they, uh, they are excellent with electric motors. They're reasonable, great staff. Um, can't, can't recommend them highly enough. They're, they're an awesome place. I took it there and he checked it real quick, said, yep, it's the capacitor. Sold me a different capacitor because they didn't have one that looked just like that one. 
it is now this silver capacitor that is zip tied underneath this bracket. So he cut the wires off the old capacitor, put these terminals on for me, gave me the uh, new capacitor, 10 bucks. It cost me probably five times the time to drive up there and probably more in diesel than it cost me for the capacitor, but it was worth it to make sure it was, it was fixed correctly. So now that the new capacitor is in there and it lights, let's do some adjustments on it because that is the next step. On the back of this motor, which I mentioned earlier, is an air pump. Uh, there should be an air cleaner in this hole, which there is not. So I also purchased a filter kit, so we'll get that installed. That's, that's the other reason I left this side cover off for now. There's a fuel filter located right up here that came with the air filter kit, so we'll change that fuel filter as well. But let's take this cover off. There's actually two filters in here. There's an intake filter, which is what's missing. And there's also an outlet filter, which is under this side of the cover. There's part of the outlet filter. There's also a little, little piece of foam in here that's part of the filter. Take that out. My fingers would work. Uh, under this cover is the actual air pump. Pull this off and make an adjustment on that pump and show you how it works. This will probably be quicker with a power driver of some kind. But we're out in the garage. So if you remove this plate, underneath here is the air pump rotor. And there's two Phillips head screws on this ring. If you loosen this ring up, it's adjustable up and down. So we'll use a feeler gauge here in a moment to set the gap up top up here. And we'll take this off to show you the air pump. air pump consists of this rotor, this little drive tab which goes in this notch in the back of the rotor, and these four little vanes. This, this rotor and vane kit is available. Um, parts for this heater really aren't ridiculously expensive. I think we had like maybe $30 in that board, I had $40 in the igniter, I think I found this rotor kit if I needed it on, on like Amazon for maybe $22 or something. So the, the parts aren't, aren't horribly expensive. I think the filter kit was like $10. So we'll just put this ring back on and just set the screws in there. Now what I'm going to do is if you look at the ends of these veins, this end's worn, this end's not. So when I put these back in, I'm going to put the not worn end out. So it's kind of like a cheap rebuild without having to buy a new pump and new veins. So we'll put the better sides out. And the way this works is when the fan spins, these veins fly in an outward direction. And as you can see, there's a small gap here, a large gap here, and a small gap here. As the veins come around in this small gap area, it fills full of air, it travels around to this point, and then when it gets over here, it compresses it out and pushes it this way. So it's drawing air into the gap and pushing it out of the gap as it spins. So that's how that works. So we'll get a feeler gauge. The book on this calls for three to four thousandths. So we'll get a three thousandths feeler gauge. 
Make sure our Phillips head screws are loose. Stick our feeler gauge in that top gap. Push down on the ring. Snug the screws a little. Make sure they're good and tight. Spin the fan to make sure we're not having any interference, which we're not. And we can put our cover back on. So that's how we adjust the air gap on that. And when you put these bolts back on, again it would be quicker if we had a like a drill with a nut driver on it. But you definitely wouldn't want to tighten these that way because that could cause damage to that rotor. So we'll just put them in. Tighten them all till they just touch. Make sure it's nice and level on there. Then we'll just snug them up, almost like you do a wheel on a car, in a crisscross pattern. Each time, checking to make sure it still spins. Okay, we look good there. So we'll open our new filter kit. And there's our fuel filter. We'll put that in, in a second. There's our little foam piece. Stick that in the square hole. There's our new outlet filter. That looks to be in a little bit better shape than this old one. Stick that on here. And our inlet filter is just this square block of foam. I guess I'll stick it in here first. There we go. Put that in there. Put this one in here. Reinstall our screws. There we go. Get through the hole in that gasket. started. Now just bring these up snug. And that just leaves one more place that we can adjust. This port and this port is how you adjust the pressure on this pump. You can remove this plug and install a pressure gauge. Once again, this was only like $8 on Amazon. Screw that gauge in there. And the specifications on this is 5.1 PSI. So let me change this fuel filter real quick before we do that. It's just as simple as pulling uh, the hose off the top of the filter. It's a little... Okay, maybe it's not so simple. Not a lot of 
room to work there. Take it off the bottom, there's the old filter. Pop the new filter in the line, down in the tank. Hose on the top of the filter, and there we go, the new filter's all in. Let me uh, grab a paper towel and wipe the diesel off or the uh, kerosene off my fingers before we go any further. Okay, let's turn this back on, see if it runs, and adjust our pressure. Okay, the igniter is glowing. We should uh, fire up here in a second. I'm glad it did that. One problem you come up with when you're fixing these heaters, they don't tend to want to run with the cover off. Um, that cover helps guide all this air from the fan into this burner hole back here. With the cover off, a lot of that air is spilling out, so there's not enough air to give you a proper burn. Now, we were to about 6 PSI on the gauge when I started to adjust it. So let me get the cover. We'll sit the cover over, not the whole way back, but we'll put the cover over most of this and we'll start it back up and try it again with the cover on it and see if it stays running. Okay, that should do it there. So let me turn it back on. And we'll try and get that pressure adjusted at 5.1. Now 5.5. Okay, there it was, just a little over 5.1. And as you can see, it stayed running. It's already hot in here. <laughs> so we'll take the gauge back out. Put our plug back in. And the only thing left to do will be to stick this board back on and uh, put the cover back on. Like I said, I need to get new screws for the cover. To do it properly. There's our plug back in, our adjustment set. Put our side cover on. And we now have an operational heater for the garage. So I hope this video was helpful. If anyone's working on uh, their own torpedo here. I think this one had probably most of the problems you're going to encounter were on this heater. So most issues you should be able to use at least one part of this video to help diagnose why yours won't run. Slide this cover back where it belongs. The only other thing I'm missing on the back here there should be a plastic uh, like a grill and I'll just need to order one of those. Once again, like I said, parts for these, you look anywhere on the internet, they're available without a, without a hitch. So this is a 115,000 BTU unit. Um, I believe it's made by DESA, D-E-S-A. I think they also make the ready heater heaters. Um, this one is a kerosene or jet fuel or diesel or fuel oil model. It's a multi-fuel, which is good. Right now we're running kerosene in it, but more than likely once we get the diesel tank filled for the new tractor, we'll probably run the uh, number two off-road diesel in this just because we're going to have it rather than having kerosene and diesel. Only thing I don't like about this heater is the location of the fuel fill. It's right here. It's kind of under the side of the heater. It's hard to, uh, hard to get in there. It's even hard to get the filler out because it's got the gauge on it. So that's my only complaint about this heater is that uh, location of that fuel fill. 
Thanks for watching our heated repair video. If you have any questions or comments, please put them down below. Please subscribe and give us a thumbs up. Have a good day.